True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is episode 28, The Murder of Gabriella Cabrins Alban. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporter for the week, Renee. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. It is greatly appreciated. If you're able to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. There are so many ways to support a podcast, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing episodes on social media and inviting your friends and family to listen, as well as interacting on our social media platforms where we discuss cases, are all really good ways to show your support. A few people have requested the case that I'm covering today, and I will admit that while I was aware of it happening at the time, I hadn't really delved down into the minutiae of the case until I started researching it. It became one of those cases where the rabbit holes have their own rabbit holes. Today's case is a little different from our usual cases, because although it happened in South Africa, both the victim and the perpetrator are from other countries. And as such, when this case happened, the spotlight was on our country's legal system from a global perspective. The case highlights some interesting aspects about what makes South Africa a desirable destination for some foreign tourists, and it's not necessarily our beautiful beaches or Big Five. Most importantly, this case highlights a global epidemic of domestic violence and a mother and father's international fight to get justice for their daughter. The sources I used in researching today's case are predominantly media articles, as well as two court documents, one from South Africa and one American. For my rabbit hole research, I used various internet sources, which I will cite where possible. I'll also be including several audio clips, which come from media houses. So without further ado... Let's get into episode 28, The Murder of Gabriella Cabrins Alban. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Gabriella Cabrins Alban was born on the 14th of May, 1976, to Howdy and Doris Cabrins. She would be the couple's only child. The couple is of both Jewish and Mexican descent, and Gabriella grew up being deeply familiar with both cultures. Her parents are also descendants of people who immigrated from Mexico and struggled significantly to build their American dream, and this family history would become deeply entrenched in Gabriella as she grew up committed to serving the Hispanic community and fighting for the underdog. Gabriella's father was very successful in the restaurant business, and throughout her childhood he ran restaurants which became iconic in Los Angeles and Malibu. The Cabrins were a success story, having built an extremely successful life in America and reaping the financial rewards of their hard work. That success, unfortunately, did not extend to their marriage, as when Gabriella was quite young, Hardy and Doris divorced. They appear to have remained on good terms and worked together to raise their daughter. Both would go on to remarry, and Gabriella would form close bonds with both her stepfather and stepmother, as well as a stepsister she gained. Doris spoke only Spanish to Gabriella, 
wanting to ensure that her daughter remained closely linked to her roots. Doris's love for the Spanish language extended to her work, as she would go on to work as a court translator in the O.J. Simpson trial. Heidi describes his daughter as having been quite a boisterous child, and she loved the outdoors, a passion they both shared. In photographs that he shared with the press of Gabriella as a child, they're almost always in some exciting outdoor setting together, boating or hiking. In later audio clips, you'll hear Gabriella's dad talk about their special word, which was the Spanish word, sonrisa, which means smile. They both loved the word because it sounded like sunrise, but they both took it to represent the concept that if the sun rises, then there's always something to smile about. Gabriella went on to study marketing and communications at Pepperdine University in California. When she graduated in 1998, her father gave her a watch engraved with their special word, Sonrisa. Soon after graduating, Gabriella co-founded her own company called Conexion, which became extremely successful with big-name clients like General Electric and Ford. Gabriella wasn't your ordinary executive, though, and with her deep interest in Hispanic workers' rights, she would only work with businesses who operated ethically from that perspective. She became extremely popular among her clients, many of which would become lifelong friends. Gabriella enjoyed the party scene in Los Angeles and all over the world, but she never allowed it to take over her life. She was a moderate drinker and not known to have been involved in drugs at all. In 2002, Gabriella married Blake Alban, a paediatrician. Blake would become a big part of Gabriella's family, with her father describing him as a son. Unfortunately, after eight years of marriage, Gabriella and Blake divorced in 2010, having had no children. I can't say for sure, of course, what the reason was for the breakdown in the marriage, but Gabriella's actions after her divorce make me think that perhaps she wanted to have a child, and maybe her ex-husband hadn't wanted that. Regardless of the reason, in 2014, Gabriella made a decision that would deeply impact her future. She made contact with the man she had dated for a few months while she was at university, Diego Doherty Novella. Gabriella and Diego had dated for a brief period while she was studying at Pepperdine University. There are conflicting reports about whether Diego was also a student there, as some say that he was simply living in the area at the time, and the pair met at a party. Their relationship didn't last long, as Diego was a cocaine user, and this was something that Gabriella didn't agree with, so she broke up with him. Diego Doherty Novella was no struggling drug user, though. The Guatemalan national was part of the richest family in Guatemala, his family owned a 117-year-old cement and construction conglomerate called Cementos Progreso, which employed over 5,000 people. They're worth billions and were very influential in Central and South America. Diego was the fifth of seven children and was born in 1974 to Margarita Maria Novella and John Paul Doherty Arguello. Both of his parents were deeply religious, following the Catholic faith, and one of Diego's brothers would later say that, although his siblings were not as religious as their parents, they were all raised to believe in goodness and to do good things. Being a prominent family in Guatemala, meant that the novellas were targets for kidnapping for ransom schemes 
and they chose to send their children to a Catholic boarding school in the US for much of their childhood. When Diego was 15 years old, his older brother Paul was killed in a car accident. He would later speak of this incident and how Paul's death destroyed his mother. His sister said that Diego and Paul had been very close, and Paul's death had started Diego on a downward spiral of rebellious behaviour. Whether it was this that had started Diego's troubles or not, it is very clear that Diego is the proverbial black sheep in the novella clan. Looking at the business listing of the Cementos Progreso group, Diego is the only family member not listed as a director on the board. While this may certainly have been of his own choosing, it definitely indicates that his life had taken a very different route to his siblings. Despite this, Diego was not financially segregated from his family, and he received a 10,000 US dollar monthly allowance from his trust fund. Diego's rebellious nature, paired with his seeming disinterest in working or settling down, and his access to a monthly income which was almost three times the average American salary, was a recipe for disaster. Diego's siblings only had good things to say about him, though, and he was described as a kind and soft-hearted young man who was always full of energy. His brother said that Diego lived a party lifestyle, travelling across the world, and at the age of 21, it became clear that he could no longer keep a cocaine habit that he developed in check. He quickly plummeted into a deep cocaine and crack addiction, which he funded with his monthly income from his family. Diego allegedly attempted to recover from his addiction on several occasions, and this led to him developing an interest in alternative treatments for addiction. While most rehabilitation programs will involve helping users to stop using drugs through the introduction of medication to treat any underlying mental health issues, paired with psychotherapy, there's an alternative to this which is sometimes used in conjunction with traditional methods. It involves focusing on the spiritual health of the addict, and not necessarily from a religious sense, but more from the perspective of human consciousness. Diego would go on to visit many different parts of the world, seeking out such spiritual journeys, including five months in a Buddhist retreat in Barcelona. It was during this time that he would become familiar with alternative medicines, which are sometimes used to treat addiction, including ibogaine and skeletium. Ibogaine is a naturally occurring psychoactive substance, which is derived from a few different plants. It is a psychedelic compound, which means that it produces hallucinations, and it's used to expand consciousness. Originally, it was used by tribes in Africa and South America as part of a rite of passage. Since its discovery by the Western world, it has become a widely used hallucinogenic and part of alternative therapy for addiction and several mental health conditions. Due to its non-chemical nature, Ibogaine is not habit-forming, although it is possible for users to believe that they need it to stay clean, which in itself becomes a form of psychological addiction. Diego came across Ibogaine in a few treatment centres that he attended, and he felt that the compound was a key to his healing. Ibogaine is illegal in many countries in the world, simply because if it's used by a person who doesn't know what they're doing, it can be deadly. It is, however, legal for use in professional situations in South Africa. And I was interested to discover that we are one of the few countries in the world who have several rehabilitation centres that specifically use Ibogaine 
as one of their treatment methods. One of our local clinics runs from a website called the Iboga Association and lists its location as Friedehoek, Devil's Peak, in the City Bowl of Cape Town. The clinic acknowledges the usefulness of Ibogaine, but also how powerful it can be in that they only treat one patient at a time in their clinic, ensuring that all of the attention of their medical staff is focused on the patient's well-being. It is clinics like this, as well as another based in Michalisburg, that have become attractions for tourists who live in countries where the treatment is not available. The facilities cater to international guests by placing their clinics in scenic locations and pairing it with a hotel and a spa-like experience. In 2014, when Gabriella made contact with Diego again, he was in between treatments and occasionally using cocaine while trying to stay clean by using ibogaine in small doses. While it seems that the pair entered into a full-on relationship at this time, Gabriella's mother would later say that it had been centered around an arrangement. Gabriella wanted a baby, and in return, she said that she would marry Diego so that he could gain a green card. It seems, though, that this arrangement was made because Gabriella felt that although she loved Diego, the feeling was not mutual, and indeed his future actions would seem to confirm that. Shortly after Gabriella divorced her husband, she began to feel ill, and although at first she put it down to stress, she soon developed more worrying symptoms that caused her to seek medical advice. Gabriella was experiencing severe lethargy, pains in her joints, and tingling sensations in her hands and feet. After many months of incorrect diagnoses and suffering, it was eventually determined that she had Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a secondary condition caused after a person is bitten by a tick. If identified and treated immediately, a full recovery can be made. But if the person is unaware that they've been bitten by a tick, the diagnosis can be missed. And Lyme disease can become a chronic condition with debilitating effects. The disease made life extremely difficult for an ordinarily independent Gabriella, as she was often too weak to get out of bed and even spent a period in a wheelchair. Now in a relationship with Diego, Gabriella decided to cement their partnership and she moved to Guatemala to live with him. While Diego's family would say that the couple seemed very happy together and that they were very affectionate, Gabriella's parents had a different view. At one stage, Gabriella became so ill that she had to be hospitalized, and they allege that Diego treated her very badly. Although his family could afford the best medical care, he allowed an ambulance to take her to a squalid government clinic where her condition only worsened. Diego allegedly complained continuously about having to care for Gabriella, on one occasion sending her mother a message to say that she should just fetch her because he was tired of her laziness. There seemed to be classic signs of abuse developing in the relationship as well. Gabriella was withdrawing from her friends and family, and her father was very worried about her. While they wanted their daughter to be happy, they had never had a great impression of Diego. The couple had travelled to a family wedding in Mexico when Gabriella had still been well enough to do so, and this is what her father had to say about this encounter and his concern for his daughter. I only met him once uh, for a couple of days. Uh, I had certain impressions. My daughter was a young woman, and I, not easy to tell your young child or your young daughter, but you know, she was a mature woman, but I had impressions, and I was concerned. You know, having said that, 
um, their relationship, uh, if it was ever a strong relationship, clearly deteriorated. The pressure on the relationship seems to have become too much, and perhaps also wanting to seek better medical treatment. In early 2015, Gabriella returned to the US with her two dogs. Diego, it seemed, had a change of heart and continued to message and call her. In April 2015, he decided that he wanted to attempt another round of rehabilitation, perhaps prompted by his breakup, and he set about travelling to South Africa. He first met up with a travel group in Nelspreit, who took him on a guided tour of places which he deemed high energy, including the Cradle of Humankind and Sodilo Hills. He then proceeded to a treatment facility in Michalisburg. There are two such facilities in the area, but one caters predominantly to international visitors, and they offer a five-day depression and addiction package, which is likely what Diego was booked on. He received a single 200 milligram dose of Ibogaine and underwent other treatments at the centre. When his treatment was complete, he travelled to Cape Town and stayed in a few different places there. While in South Africa, Diego started an intense campaign to get Gabriella to join him here. Gabriella's father would later say that Diego had lured his daughter to South Africa with promises that he'd found a treatment for her Lyme disease. I don't know whether this was a figment of Diego's imagination or not, but he'd become convinced that the Ibogaine treatments he'd undergone would help Gabriella, and he did everything he could to convince her of this. In a weak state, and probably hoping beyond hope that this was true, and she could return to her normal life, Gabriella agreed to join Diego in South Africa. What she did next tells me that perhaps she'd intended to give their relationship another try, because instead of leaving her two dogs with her parents, or even kenneling them in the US, where they'd be safe until her return, she flew with them to Guatemala, so that they could be cared for by Diego's family. When she arrived in Guatemala, Gabriela was contacted by the local police. They were investigating a case of serious assault that had been opened against Diego by his housekeeper. The woman had claimed that Diego had become enraged at something she had done and beaten her. The police hoped that Gabriella may have been able to give information to them about the case. Whether she did or didn't is unknown but considering she had no idea that this case even existed, this would likely have been something she wanted to discuss with Diego when she saw him. Gabriella boarded a flight to South Africa in June 2015. The plan was that she would meet Diego, who was still in Cape Town, and stay with him at his accommodation. When Gabriella landed, though, she couldn't get hold of Diego. She tried for several hours until, eventually, the sun was setting and she realised that she'd have to sort herself out or risk being stuck at the airport for the night. As she was relying on Diego to plan the trip, she had no transport or accommodation, and after arranging a taxi, she went from hotel to hotel trying to find accommodation. Thankfully, June is midwinter in South Africa, so it's not a particularly busy travel season, and she was able to secure accommodation at the Camps Bay Retreat Hotel, a five-star hotel and spa, which costs upward of 8,000 rand per night. After a few days, Diego suddenly re-emerged, and Gabriella was able to get hold of him again. Bizarrely, staff at the Camps Bay Retreat Hotel said that when Diego arrived to meet Gabriella, he told the security that he was there to see his mother, and he repeatedly referred to Gabriella as his mother 
on other occasions. While this could be the beginning of some sort of mental breakdown that Diego was having, it could also have a far simpler explanation. The Spanish word for mother is madre, and the word for girlfriend is novia. So there's no confusion there, and Diego was speaking English, in which he was rather fluent. It is rather common for Hispanic people to refer to their girlfriends as mami, and although we don't know if this was a pet name that Diego had for Gabriela, it would make a lot more sense than him referring to her as his mother. When Diego and Gabriela were finally reunited, he broke the news to her that he just realised that his visa was about to expire and they would have to leave the country to renew it. The couple left South Africa and stayed in Italy for two weeks, while they waited for Diego's new visa. In the interim, they made a reservation at the Ibogaine treatment facility in Michalisburg for Gabriella, which she planned to attend on her return to the country. They booked back into the Camps Bay Retreat Hotel in the last week of July, but never attended the treatment appointment. In sporadic messages to her parents, Gabriella shared that Diego was becoming annoyed with her because she was finding it difficult to stick to the eating plan that he wanted her to follow prior to her Ibogaine treatment. He had insisted that she cut out all sugar and processed foods prior to her treatment, and she was struggling with this. I found this insistence from Diego quite interesting, and my first instinct was that It was some form of control. Controlling a victim's food intake is very common in abusive relationships. Wanting to be fair, though, I considered that perhaps this was a requirement of Ibogaine treatment, which would be odd, considering that addicts go in there and they're not on the healthiest of diets. So I checked the admission instructions on the website of the facility that Diego was taking Gabriella to. And while it gives detailed explanations of the process and pre-admission requirements, there is absolutely no mention of restricting your diet before admission. So without any other explanation, it seems that this was indeed a method of control on Diego's part. This food issue would play into the case at a later stage in the most horrifying of ways. Diego and Gabriella booked spa treatments and tennis sessions for July the 29th and seemed to the hotel staff to be just like any other couple on holiday. At 1am on the morning of July 29th, Diego came down from his room and reportedly sat staring at the barman for 15 minutes straight. He didn't order anything to drink. He just sat there wordlessly staring at the man. He then wandered around the hotel for the next few hours, prompting a staff member to politely inquire whether he thought perhaps he should go to sleep. Diego stared at the man and repeated the word sleep. Then he said, no, I cannot sleep, because to me, sleep is nothing. He eventually returned to his room. At 5 a.m., call logs show telephone calls being made from Diego and Gabriela's room. These would later be found to have been international calls, including several to members of Diego's family, directors of his family's business, and the Guatemalan embassy in the United States. There were also several text messages from Diego to his siblings. At 7 a.m., He called down to reception and cancelled his tennis session and Gabriella's spa treatment for the day. About an hour later, he wandered down to the reception and had a short conversation with the receptionist. The young woman off-handedly asked Diego where his lovely lady was that morning, as she hadn't seen or heard from Gabriella at all. Diego replied, 
that Gabriella was dead. I cannot for a minute imagine what that moment was like for that young receptionist. After asking him to repeat what he just said, which he did, she asked him how long Gabriella had been dead for, and he said, just a few hours. I'm thinking that at this point, the woman probably thought that Gabriella had died of natural causes, as she had been ill. I'm pretty sure that she wouldn't have made the leap in that moment between this man saying that his girlfriend was dead and murder. Probably thinking that he was in shock, she asked him if he'd like something to drink, and he requested water. She called several of her superiors to reception, and Diego repeated the same thing to them. Gabriella was dead. As Diego continued to wander around the hotel, being watched by staff, the hotel manager grabbed the spare key and headed up to room number 14 to check on Gabriella. He knocked on the door for several minutes, receiving no reply, and then he made entry. I have no doubt that the scene that met him will live with him for the rest of his life. The room is large, I'd call it a suite. It's about the size and layout of a really smart bachelor flat. The bed is not immediately visible as you walk in the door, but he would have already acknowledged that something smelled badly in the room before he rounded the partition and cast eyes on the bedroom area. The body of 39-year-old Gabriella Cabrins Alban was on the floor next to the bed. She'd been badly beaten and her eyes were swollen shut. She was nude from the waist down and her legs had been pulled apart. Between them, her attacker had placed a hair straightening iron and hair extensions which had been ripped from her own head. On her chest was a note scrawled in lipstick. It read, Sevote, which in Spanish means a nothing or a piece of shit. In a final insult, her attacker had defecated on her face and then sprinkled pieces of broken potato chips over her. The pathologist would later find that Gabriela had whole sweets and items of food like chocolate bars, hard candies, and more potato chips shoved into her mouth with such force that her throat, mouth, and teeth had been damaged. She had also been sodomized. She had undoubtedly been dead for several hours before her body was discovered. The police were called and I assume that because the victim was an American citizen, the FBI also attended the scene. I found it really interesting that this fact was not reported in any of the media outlets. I was initially surprised to read this, as I naively wondered how they'd got there so fast. My friend Google told me that the FBI has several foreign offices, and one of them is in Pretoria. Who knew? I actually found that information about them being at the scene in a court document which I'll discuss a little later. It's from a civil case that Gabriella's family would file in California many years later. But that's skipping too far ahead. For now, Gabriella's body has been found. Diego, when questioned at Camps Bay Police Station, admitted that he killed her, and at 3 a.m. U.S. time, Hardy Cabrins was about to get the worst news of his life. I was shocked. Uh, My my family was shocked. We got a phone call at 3 a.m. from the State Department. Uh, We really did not know how horrific everything was until we got here and had a chance to meet with the investigation, the investigating team and meet with the forensic pathology team and, and find out, you know, you know, 
horrible details. The hotel room was in complete disarray. Food wrappers and packets were scattered all over, and police found a large bag of a white powdery substance on Gabriella's bedside table. There were also two glass pipes which are used to smoke drugs. The media somehow found this out, and when the first stories started to emerge about the murder, they took on a narrative that was not only completely untrue, but utterly bizarre and disrespectful to the victim, considering no one had the facts yet. For several days after Gabriella's death, the media reported that she had died in a, quote, bizarre, cocaine fueled sex game gone wrong, end quote. The distance between this claim and the truth is vast. The white powder, it turned out, was Epsom salts, which Gabriella put in her bath to ease her joint pains. No illegal drugs were found in Gabriella's system. The way that his daughter was portrayed in the media devastated Heidi Cabrons. Um, what the initial reaction was to uh, let the world know that this is not you know, what was said in, the, in these papers was, was so contrary to, you know, who she really was and what her core values, you know, were, you know, all her life. I mean, she, she, she was, a, uh, you know, well-educated, well-studied, and, 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 and not, you know, not involved in the uh, drug scene at all. She'd, you know, have a martini at, you know, at a fine restaurant, and she knew some good wines, but this was not her... Um, not her style. Not her style, and it may sound like I'm, you know, overstating, you know, to you know try to cover up, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, what was you know so strongly suggested. But if I'm not, as I sit here, and and in her name, this was nothing. You know, this was not like her at all. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, it, it's very important, I think, for myself and and uh, 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 Doris, my ex-wife, and 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 all our family to. You know, let the world know that you know this was not uh, uh, not your Gabby, not my uh, not my Gabby. Yeah. I'd call her Gabe, but but in Spanish I call her mi hija, my daughter, my little girl. Oh. This was one of the reasons that Howdy was so vocal in the media. He wasn't going to let the world believe this fabricated narrative of his daughter. Diego was found to have skeletium, dronabinol and cannabis in his system. Skeletium is extracted from a South African plant and has been used as an alternative medicine for hundreds of years to treat a wide variety of ailments. The extract has sedative effects. Dronabinol is actually a prescription drug which contains a synthetic variant of THC, the active component in cannabis. It's unknown whether Diego actually had a prescription for this drug, but it's unlikely, as it's usually prescribed to cancer and AIDS patients in order to reduce nausea and improve appetite. The drug is known to have hallucinatory side effects in some people. From day one, Diego claimed that these drugs had caused him to hallucinate and kill Gabriella. Hallucinations are relatively rare in cannabis users, as they are in dronabinol users. The combined effect could have increased the chances, but considering the relatively small amount that Diego had used, it seems unlikely. This also wasn't the first time Diego had used drugs. He was 42 years old when he committed this crime, and he'd been using cocaine in various forms, from the age of 21. I'm no expert, but it's highly doubtful that two pipes of cannabis and adrenabinol suddenly induced the level of hallucination that would cause him to kill Gabriella in such a brutal way. It also emerged that this hadn't been something that had happened over the space of 15 minutes 
and then he suddenly snapped out of it. The pathologist found that Gabriella had died a slow and agonizing death. She had been sexually assaulted, with Diego having sodomized her and used the hair straightener to penetrate her. She had also been beaten, with her head having been smashed against the floor. She was strangled, and her eventual suffocation was contributed to by the foodstuffs that Diego had shoved into her mouth, as well as his act of defecating on her. The pathologist estimated that the entire ordeal took at least an hour, if not more. Soon after finding out about their daughter's horrifying death, Heidi and Doris boarded a plane to South Africa with their respective spouses. Being in the restaurant business and having no idea when he'd be able to return, Heidi had to shut down his business. He was never able to reopen that establishment. In shock and in a foreign country, Gabriella's parents were thankfully welcomed and supported by officials and citizens alike. During their eventual 11 total trips to South Africa, they would build friendships that would extend far beyond this incident. Although his elderly parents were not able to travel, Diego too had family support. His siblings took turns in making trips out to South Africa and described the horror of finding out what their brother had done. The Novella family reached out to Gabriella's parents to give them their condolences. It's, uh, it, was, it, it was genuine. It was genuine and I'm sure very, very difficult you know, for uh, his family. They did not murder my daughter, he did. With his family money, Diego was able to fund one of the best defense lawyers in South Africa, William Booth. But even this hard-hitting attorney was not able to get him out on bail. Quite rightly, the judge decided that the flight risk was just too great. Diego had no ties in South Africa, and he had access to almost unlimited funds. It would be very easy for him to slip out of the country and disappear so he was denied bail and remanded to Polesmore Prison until the start of his trial. While he was awaiting trial, his father passed away in Guatemala, and, of course, Diego was not allowed to attend his funeral. As we well know, South African trials are often subject to delays because of the lack of resources and overloading of the court system. Unfortunately, this would mean that Gabriella's family would have to travel between South Africa and the United States, constantly juggling visa extensions, sometimes staying in the country just long enough for one hearing and then returning to the US to try and maintain some semblance of a life. This is Doris and her husband, Gabriella's stepdad, expressing the impact that the loss of their daughter had on them in the run-up to the trial. I have been to the hotel. I could not get myself to see yeah. to see her. I could not yeah. get the opportunity to say goodbye to her. Sometimes I can't get out of bed. And sometimes, you know, but you put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. But this is a... Uh, uh, that will never heal. Uh, I appreciate the professionalism of the prosecutor and of the court. Yeah. Um, the it, police it, were very it, courteous to us and when this awful thing happened. Yeah. And we're holding our cross. Uh, we have our fingers crossed yeah. for the future. Okay. And we hope that we hope that he will spend as much time in prison as possible. Mm. Diego pleaded not guilty, and plans he used as his defense that he had diminished capacity at the time of the crime. In his statements as to his version of events, Diego said that he and Gabriella had eaten dinner at an Italian restaurant 
on the evening of the 28th of July, and they'd started to argue over money that he claimed Gabriella owed him. On returning to the hotel, he claimed that Gabriella had smoked the same amount of cannabis as him, taken dronabinol, and snorted skeletium with him. He could not explain why Gabriella's blood showed no trace of any of the drugs he claimed she'd taken. He said that at some stage during the night, he'd walked out of the room, and through a glass door, he'd looked at Gabriella, and she had appeared to him as a demonic entity. He claims that he heard a voice tell him to go over to the window, which was next to the bed, and open the curtains. I must just interject here and tell you that when Diego refers to the entity in his statement, he's actually talking about Gabriella. I find it very difficult to refer to this innocent victim as the entity and it, but he seems to have no problem doing so in an effort to support his hallucination claims. He says that when he opened the curtains, the entity that had been sleeping on the bed got up and began to argue with him. He claims that the entity then began to attack him, and in defence, he pushed it to the floor and began to strangle it. As the entity began to resist, he punched it in the face, and then it stopped fighting back. He realised that the entity was not moving anymore, and thought that he must have killed it. He then proceeded to defecate on the entity, scattered potato chips over it, and wrote the note. He claimed not to remember shoving food into Gabriella's mouth, and said that the sexual assault was a consensual act. In translation, Gabriella was asleep in the bed, when Diego decided that he didn't want her to sleep anymore, and he opened the curtain, letting the streetlight flood the room. This disrespectful and blatantly mean act clearly annoyed Gabriella, who stood up and started to argue with him, and the attack proceeded from there. Gabriella was found nude from the waist down. If, according to Diego... She had been asleep in bed before the attack took place. I would presume that she would not be sleeping with only clothing on the top half of her body. I know that some people do sleep naked, but half naked seems strange. And it was, after all, winter in South Africa. This pretty much blows his claim of consensual sex out of the water. Because if they started arguing as soon as she got up, and the attack immediately ensued, when did they have opportunity to stop fighting and have consensual sex and then continue fighting? Clearly, the sexual assault followed on from his violent attack on her. He says that his next recollection was of returning to the room in a daze and realising that something bad had happened there. He admitted that he had called family members, including his father, and told them that Gabriella was dead, and that he was going to need assistance. So, on entering the room, he was so dazed that he had to realise that Gabriella was dead. But within minutes, he was coherent enough to contact his family and start arranging help for himself. Those are some really convenient hallucinations. The first police officer on the scene testified that in his 30 years in the police force, the scene was the worst thing he had ever seen done to another human being. Both of Gabriella's parents and her step-parents testified to the immense loss and devastation they felt at her death. One of Gabriella's cousins, in seeing a photograph of Diego during the trial, he looked like he was at a resort. He said that the one time he had seen Diego before Gabriella's death, the man had been very thin and looked ill and ashen. He marvelled at how a year in Polsmore's hospital ward 
had seemingly turned him around, and he looked healthier than ever. Before we get into the judge's decision and sentencing portion of the trial, I wanted to tell you about something interesting that I found while I was researching. One of Gabriella's cousins mentioned a tattoo that Diego had on his neck of the number 13. They said that it was assumed that this was done as part of his rebellion against his parents' deep religious beliefs. Then I saw a Times Live journalist refer to the tattoo in an article as well, and they mentioned that they'd investigated this tattoo as being gang-affiliated. The gang that the journalist mentioned is called Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13. MS-13 originated in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s, as a protection group for Salvadoran immigrants, but they soon morphed into a criminal street gang. Today, MS-13 has approximately 50,000 members worldwide, and they are particularly strong in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. The gang is known for its cruel forms of torture, and they've been linked to several cases of femicide and infanticide across the world. Now, let me be clear in saying that I don't think for a minute that Gabriella's murder was gang-related, but I do think that there are some very interesting parallels between the way this gang operates, Diego's possible involvement with the gang, and the details of the murder. Diego spent most of his life looking for something deeper to connect with, it seems, and there is significant evidence that while he was living in Los Angeles in his 20s, he became involved with MS-13. Whether he was actually initiated into the gang, or he just aligned with their ideals, is unknown. But I don't think that the tattoo on his neck had anything to do with rebelling against his parents. The word that Diego wrote on the notes he placed on Gabriela's body, Sevote, interested me, and I wanted to find out more about the word and its use in the Spanish language. I found an article by a woman who had studied how the use of particular phrases and words creates a sense of belonging in various groups of Hispanic people. It's very similar to our concept here in South Africa of different groups having their own jargon, which when used identifies you as belonging to that specific group of people. The reason I found this article was that the author referred to the use of the word sevote, and she explained how people who use the word are usually purposefully aligning themselves with a specific group. And guess what one of those groups is? MS-13. I wasn't looking for a connection between the word and the gang when I started. I just wanted to understand the types of situations that the word Savorte might be used in, as with language, context is very important. So I took a double and then a triple take when MS-13 came up. According to the author of the article, the link between the word and the gang started in prisons, where gangs would commonly use specific words which created a sense of belonging and identified your affiliation. All this is very interesting, but does it actually mean anything in the context of Gabriella's murder? Well, no, it doesn't. But I do think that it might have been pretty significant to Diego, and I definitely think that he was very specific about choosing that word. The possibility exists that he was just a poor little rich boy trying to act tougher than he was. But I think the possibility also exists that Diego thought he might be deported to serve his sentence in a Guatemalan jail. And if his crime bore the signs of gang affiliations, he might just be offered some form of protection in prison. But these are just some thoughts that I had around this connection, 
and there's, of course, absolutely no solid proof that any of it is true. I also haven't seen the link connected by anyone else. I did find it very, very interesting, though, and I thought I'd share it with you, because it certainly points to a level of premeditation. After numerous delays, and almost three years after the death of Gabriela Cabrins Alban, Diego Doherty Novella was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment on the 6th of September 2018. In conclusion, my view, the version proffered by the accused is inherently improbable and is not reasonably possibly true. I harbor no doubt in rejecting the version of the accused. In my view, the stated proof beyond reasonable doubt that the accused murdered the deceased was Gabriella Cadence Alvin with the intent of donors directors. The accused is found guilty and is charged. In passing his sentence, Judge Saldana said that the matter of possible parole would have to be addressed when the time came, as in his view, considering that Diego would be deported back to Guatemala upon his release. Parole would be ineffective, as South African authorities would have no way of monitoring his behaviour. Gabriela's family were satisfied with the outcome. I feel there's some, there's an element of relief. The three years have been very, very difficult for me. And I wasn't given the chance to mourn my child. And I think that I will do that. And, and, um, and I hope that he gets as long a sentence as possible. And I wish him a very long life. In prison. Traveled 10,000 miles and we got another he has been so 10 million miles to go to, to keep her name and her spirit alive. Everybody. There's a father who'll do anything for my daughter and she's not here, but I'll, I'll keep going. So that's I got a job to do. We got a job to do. In a further traumatizing consequence, Gabriella's remains had to be buried in two different places Los Angeles and the Jewish section of Pineland Cemetery in South Africa. Her parents returned to the US to try and rebuild their lives. I mentioned a lawsuit which was brought by Heidi Cabrins in the US earlier. In 2017, while the criminal trial was still ongoing in South Africa, Heidi and Doris opened a civil case of wrongful death in California. As defendants in the case, they named not only Diego Doherty Novella, but also several unnamed parties with connections to the Doherty Novella clan and the conglomerate Cementos Progreso. I don't know this for sure, but I wonder if the revelation that family members, as well as directors at the company, were contacted by Diego at 5 a.m. South African time on the day of the murder was the reason behind this inclusion of other unnamed parties. The other possibility is that because Diego's entire lifestyle was funded by these people and it was this lifestyle that, in part, led to Gabriella's death, her parents feel that they should be held accountable. Either way, I found the court document for the civil trial online, and it held a wealth of information about this case, which I included in this episode, much of which was never reported in South African media at the time of the trial. A successful civil trial will result in financial compensation to Gabriella's parents, and Hardy told US media that he plans to use this money to set up a foundation which will be a voice for the victims of domestic violence, both in the US and in South Africa. As at the release of this episode, 
and the shout out to CJ from Beyond the Rainbow podcast for finding this information for me. The civil case is still ongoing in the US. It has been delayed due to the COVID outbreak and the next date set down for court appearance is August this year. Howdy said it himself. Diego's family did not kill Gabriella. But surely, they must be able to connect the dots between them having funded his lifestyle and the freedom he had to commit this crime. Also, if they are sorry about Gabriella's death as they say they are, surely they would want to willingly contribute to a foundation that may save other lives. Unfortunately, though, Settling may require them to admit some uncomfortable truths. A quick word about the Doherty Novella family. I told you there were rabbit holes in the rabbit holes in this case. I mentioned that they are committed Catholics. Well, they are also one of the few families that publicly admits to being part of a group called Opus Dei. Now, firstly... There's no proof that Opus Dei is an official entity within the Catholic Church at all. In fact, it just seems to be an offshoot that has formed organically over many years. Opus Dei is an exclusive group, or a secret society of sorts. It's a group of people who identify with the Catholic religion, who in different countries across the world, most especially South American countries, identify themselves as different or separate from the rest of society. Members of the group allegedly include several high-profile Catholics across the world, and the reason that it is so strange that this family would admit to being members is that hardly anyone ever does admit their membership. While publicly, Opus Dei is alleged to only support members by providing business networks, spiritual support and the like, rumours have run rife for years that there is something far more sinister at work within the organisation. In all fairness, many journalists have called the claims made against the group fabrications, and we all know that conspiracy theories can get out of hand very quickly. The group was most famously outed in the novel and movie The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, and some have referred to it as a cult-like organisation. Again, this is all speculation, and based on the opinions of others. I just thought that it was another interesting rabbit hole to take you down. Diego Doherty Novella was remanded to Polsmore Prison to serve out his sentence. He attempted to appeal the sentence, but his application was declined. If he serves his full sentence, he will be 64 on his release, and he will be immediately deported to Guatemala and be refused any future entries into South Africa. In 2019, the Malibu Times reported that Hardy Cabrons was planning on opening a new restaurant, after he'd had to close his previous establishment to fight for justice for his daughter. He is well loved in the Malibu community, and I have no doubt that this new venture will be a success. Despite all of the distractions and sidelines in this case, the drugs, possible gang affiliations, trust funds and alternative medicines, the core of what happened here is pretty clear to me. Diego Doherty Novella is a classic abuser. He recognised that Gabriella was in a weakened state due to her illness, and he used it to try and control her and demean her. When she broke free and returned to the US, where she would be safe from him, he was having none of that. I don't think Hardy Cabrons belief that Diego lured Gabriella to Cape Town was far off, to be honest. I believe that he wanted to get her away from her family and everything that she knew and into a foreign country 
where she had no support system so that he could break her down again and put her back under his control. To do this, he used the one thing that he knew Gabriella wanted more than anything, her health. All Gabriella wanted to do was get better so that she could go back to living the life she loved, and Diego used that to manipulate her. Hoping beyond hope that perhaps Diego had changed and she could come to South Africa, get better, and have the baby she so desperately wanted with the man she loved, Gabriella boarded a plane to her doom. The savage and despicable way he killed her and then defiled her body speaks volumes about what he really felt about Gabriella. He referred to her as the entity and it. And I don't think that was just in relation to his alleged hallucination. That is how Diego saw Gabriella. To him, she was just another thing to amuse himself with. Gabriella Cabrins Alban was deeply loved by all who knew her. She was making a difference in the world, and she would have continued to do so. Gabriella was not a drug user, and she was not involved in a sex game when she died. She was completely sober, weakened, and she was raped and savagely murdered. I have no doubt that Hardy Cabrins will start his foundation in his daughter's name, and in his words, if one life can be saved, we will have succeeded in doing justice for Gabby. Thank you for listening to episode 28, The Murder of Gabriella Cabrins Alban. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on the app that you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I usually release a full episode every second week, but during lockdown, I'm releasing one every week to give you more content to listen to. I'll be back next week with a new case. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.